Have you ever looked closely at granite countertops? I mean, have you ever looked closely at granite countertops? Although they are a huge investment, homeowners love them because they are, are attractive, durable, and they last forever. But have you ever wondered why? Have you ever wondered why all granite countertops look different? Or what all the different colors actually mean? It's probably safe to say that you know that granite is a type of rock. Or is it a type of stone? Or is it a mineral? Perhaps you aren't so sure after all. At least you know it's not a fossil or a gem, right? But what do all these words actually mean? Mineral, gem, rock, stone, fossil, and sediment. When do you call something a rock or a stone? What's the difference between a mineral and a gem? And do fossils count as rocks or minerals? Or neither? Or both? In this module, we will explore these questions and more. We might as well start from the basic building blocks of our universe, atoms. Recall that all matter in the universe, everything that has mass and takes up space, consists of atoms, and that atoms themselves consist of three types of subatomic particles, positively charged protons, negatively charged electrons, and non-charged neutrons. Neutrons and protons make up the nuclei or the centers of the atoms, and the electrons occur in a cloud around the nuclei, orbiting the nuclei like planets. There are many types of atoms called elements. Each element has a unique number of protons, its atomic number. Hydrogen, the lightest element, for example, has the atomic number one, because it has one proton in its nucleus. Carbon, the most important element for life, on the other hand, has six protons. Its atomic number is six. Atoms come together to form chemical compounds, substances consisting of two or more elements combined in a fixed proportion. The atoms are held together by bonds, like strong covalent bonds or weak ionic bonds. The numbers of atoms and their elements in a molecule can be written down as a chemical formula. For example, water, a chemical compound, is H2O because it has two hydrogen atoms for every one oxygen atom. The two hydrogen atoms are covalently bonded to the one oxygen atom, as shown here. It doesn't matter if you look at a drop of water or an entire ocean. Pure water will always have two hydrogen atoms for every one atom of oxygen. Which brings us to minerals. Minerals are solid, naturally occurring compounds. Each mineral has a unique species name, chemical formula, and crystalline lattice structure. The compound described by the chemical formula repeats itself over and over throughout the material. But what is the crystalline lattice structure exactly? Think of this lattice like the steel beams in a skyscraper, Ex except the steel beams are actually bonds and wherever two beams would intersect, there should be an atom. You can keep building a skyscraper upward and outward by adding more steel beams and more intersections. You could do this, theoretically, forever. The same is true of minerals, which grow through the addition of more atoms and more bonds. Let's consider a few familiar minerals. Did you or your family ever use a salt grinder? Table salt, or rock salt, is a mineral called halite. Its chemical composition, which is sodium chloride, may be familiar to you. It has a very simple cubic crystal lattice structure illustrated here. 
Besides salt, what mineral do you probably see and use every day? Particularly, what mineral do you probably see and use every day if you live in the Midwest during the coldest months of the year? Ice. When water is in its solid, frozen state, it is technically a mineral, albeit an unstable one. When water freezes, its weak hydrogen bonds, which are usually weak and have a tendency to flow, become fixed in positions, creating a lattice. There are literally thousands of more mineral species, and scientists keep finding more and more. Because of their differences at the atomic level, Minerals also differ in terms of their observable properties. Minerals have many properties, such as their color, as well as their shape, and their geometry and crystal form. An important property of minerals is hardness. How well can a mineral resist being scratched? Diamonds are the hardest substance on the planet. They are very difficult to cut, and pr practically indestructible. They last forever. Compare that to halite or ice, which can be cut using very basic tools, like a knife or even your fingernail. They are not nearly as hard as diamond. Speaking of diamonds, you've probably heard the term gem or gemstone. Strictly speaking, we don't use these terms much in historical geology, or geology much for that matter at all. In general, a gem is a mineral which can be cut, polished, to make a piece of jewelry or other adornment. One might argue that all gems are minerals, but not all minerals are gemstones. However, that overlooks the fact that many gems, like amber, aren't minerals at all. So for the sake of this class, let's focus on minerals. We will now focus on the relationships between minerals and rocks and sediment. There are many types of rock and many types of sediment, which have a variety of origins. For now, let's concentrate on some generalities. Minerals are the building blocks of both rocks and sediment. Rocks and sediment consist of minerals, and the minerals you find in a rock or sediment will depend on its origin. All rocks, regardless of type or origin, are solid mixtures of cemented minerals, or minerals that are essentially glued together. The minerals themselves serve as the glue. Indeed, it's not uncommon to find dozens or more minerals in a single rock. Let's now return to granite. Granite is a type of rock. The various colors you see on the surface of granite are different types of minerals. The crystal faces of these different minerals are cemented together. Geologists often study the minerals in a rock, like granite, by preparing it as a petrographic thin section for microscopic analysis. A thin section is a slice of rock that is so thin that the light of a microscope can pass through it. Thin sections are prepared by taking a piece of rock, cutting it down to size, mounting it on a piece of glass, and continuing to cut it and polish it until it is the desired thickness, generally around 30 microns or 31 thousandths of a millimeter. Once your thin section is complete, you can stick it under a microscope and play with the properties of light that pass through it. As you can see in this sample, the use of cross-polarized light reveals a wide array of minerals in gabbro, a type of igneous rock. At this point though, you are probably asking yourself, is granite a rock or is it a stone? Students often wonder when to use these words. Generally speaking, most geologists would prefer you use the word rock. 
in conversation, people will often use the word stone um, to refer to any cobble or pebble. But stone is not very scientific. You will only hear scientists say stone when they are referring to a specific type of rock, like a limestone or a sandstone. So, suffice it to say, granite is a rock. What about sediment? You see sediment all the time. Mud, clay, sand, these are all examples of sediment. Sediment is any material consisting of particles or grains made of minerals and fragments of organisms that accumulate in loose form. The composition of sediment is related to origin. So if we study its composition, we can learn where sediment came from. Most sediment probably comes from pre-existing rock. Natural processes break rocks down into sediment. Interestingly enough, the opposite is also true. Given enough time, the grains of sediment can become cemented together, forming a type of rock called a sedimentary rock. Sandstone is an example of a sedimentary rock. It forms from the sedimentation of sand grains. You can feel these grains on the surface of a sandstone, which has a rough texture. So we've covered minerals, gems, rocks, stones, and sediment. But what about fossils? Fossils are easy to identify, but surprisingly hard to define. Why? Because fossils often con consist of one or more minerals, and they always occur either inside of solid rock or under soft sediment, like this insect in amber. The insect is clearly a fossil, but what about the amber? Amber forms from tree resin that hardens. Does that make it a fossil of a tree? In practice, most geologists consider amber to be a type of sedimentary rock. So then, what is a fossil? A good definition of a fossil is any remains or traces of an ancient organism preserved in the earth. Paleontologists usually draw the line at 10,000 years. The remains or traces of an organism must be older than 10,000 years old. It must come from a time before the start of the written history of human civilization. Is this a perfect definition of a fossil? No. In fact, when you explore the geologic record, you are bound to encounter evidence of ancient life that does not conform to this definition. Geologists, for instance, distinguish between body fossils and trace fossils. Body fossils are, well, fossils of bodily remains. Trace fossils are fossils of behavior. Important trace fossils include footprints of early humans, burrows of ancient animals, and teeth marks left in bone by ancient predators. These traces are not bodies, but they tell us a great deal about ancient life. As this module comes to a close, let's reflect on what we've learned. Atoms make up chemical compounds which occur as solids in the form of minerals. Minerals are the building blocks of rocks and sediment and even fossils. Your challenge moving forward is to learn and appreciate all the diverse minerals, rocks, sediment, and fossils that occur on our planet. Take it in steps. Good luck.